Hello, friends, and welcome back to We've Got Worm, the worm podcast read through with me, Matt Freeman, and my co host, Scott Daly. Scott, how are we doing this week? How far did we get? I'm doing really good, Matt. We today are talking about Arc 2 Insinuation. Um, this is longer than the first one, right? Yeah, this is longer. This is uh, about half again as long, I think. And I think the next one is substantially longer. And uh, <laughs> we're, 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 it's, it's a good thing it starts out this way because it gives us some, uh, some uh, runway to uh, get, get our wheels spinning. Yeah, so um, that, that's that long story that everyone keeps telling me about. I mean, so far, it's not been bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we were glancing over the statistics and saw that one of the arcs is almost 10,000 words, um, which is like a novel. I think you mean so, 100,000. Uh, yeah, that is what I mean, 100,000. That's correct. That's like a novel. So, but we're not there yet. This is just arc two insinuation. Um, so as we begin, I wanted to say that uh, we got some incredible feedback, some fantastic feedback uh, over the last week regarding the first episode. So yeah, we're definitely we good. Yeah, it was really encouraging. Um, we're, we're really, we're definitely going to be moving forward with this series and we're going to be aiming for a weekly episode uh, with about one arc per episode on the basis of how, how dense this is to be released on Wednesdays. Um, uh, Scott, we got some really good, um, like specific feedback regarding the format and, mm-hmm. and some, some suggestions. Um, Reddit user code Zeta suggested that I need to let you talk more. And I think that's fair <laughs> because. Um, I, I mean, if, if you're listening to this, odds are you, you either know the story or, or just, I think listening to summarizing is not as interesting as listening to discussion. So I'm going to be hedging back a little on the discussion, on, on, rather on the summary, and we're going to be doing a bit more back and forth discussion. Yeah. And, you know, I will support any person saying that I need to talk more because, uh, I like to talk. So, yeah, well, I like to talk to you, but I'm capable of, um, <laughs> reining myself in, uh, Reddit user the Venom Rex pointed out that we didn't really get into the themes of the story last week, and I had a convoluted justification for why this was actually involving not wanting to accidentally spoil you on anything. Like, for example, I didn't want to admit that bullying was a major theme of the story because I was like, well, if I let him know that, then he'll know where the story's going. But on reflection, I think that was silly. Um, so there's no harm in keeping track of the themes and. Especially if, especially if you're picking up on them, which you you are, you, you were the one talking about the bullying. So, yeah, and I think in retrospect, I kind of like that we didn't really jump into bullying really detailed last week, though, because I think there's a lot more of it that goes on in in this section, and I'm sure it'll continue throughout the series. But I, th- it feels like the events that happen in this arc set the scene for let's have a talk about bullying. So. I, I, I understand that, and I agree that we need, like, I tend to focus on character and character arcs and not, and and quickly talk over themes. So I think it's true that we need to to focus on theme a little bit more. So I think, I think we're going to do that this week. Yeah. Yeah. I think the context is more fitting this week. Uh, User Overpowered Ginger pointed out uh, that this is a story about people and the superpowers are icing on the cake. And um, I really agree, even though I also enjoy talking about superpowers and thinking about superpowers. Um, uh, But but he's right. He or she is right that uh, what makes this a great story is the characters. Um, It would would only be a good story without the characters. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And I, I think I think that's any good really like the best writing that's the thing right is that the situations and the the uh, events are really just a way to tell something about character right and um if you don't have that then you don't really have a story so i completely agree overpowered ginger um this is a story about characters and i could tell that and i've only read one sixtieth of it i mean <laughs> like one one hundredth i don't know yeah something in that range i think uh, user Predictablicious pointed out that we should pay attention to the unreliable narrator aspect of Taylor's narration, which I'm embarrassed to admit I never fully appreciated until I started this reread. Um, so I really have to thank them for drawing my attention to that because we actually did talk about that last week and uh, it, it's going to become even more salient this week. Um, yeah, and, and I think that was something that uh, that that's really changed my perspective on the story actually the extent to which uh to which i took taylor's 
opinions as fact on the first time around and this time it's more like well she's a teenager and and maybe a bit biased and her thoughts are not necessarily reliable yeah and i'm really glad we got this comment too because um you definitely see that in in this arc in particular um and i don't know if i had been i might have caught it i hindsight's 2020 but um the fact that i had this comment in my head as i was reading through arc two um really let me like it, it stood out more to me so so thanks very much for this comment this is the exact kind of comments i hope we get that help me read better <laughs> so um, mm-hmm. really appreciate that and finally uh sammy on the web page mentioned the closing line of the last arc uh stated that taylor's father dreamed of the ocean and, and he just kind of wanted us to, to he or she wanted us to keep our eye on this and see if see if that developed anywhere and beyond go ahead yeah no i just uh that is i'm I'm glad someone pointed that out because as i was listening through our podcast i realized that that was something that i had written down to talk about that i didn't uh get to but i just think that's clear foreshadowing um and it, i will definitely be paying attention to that going forward um i have no idea where it's going to go but <laughs> um thanks for pointing that out sammy yeah yeah that was awesome uh, and then there was a large amount of generally encouraging feedback beyond that, and we appreciate every bit of it. Um, and uh, and with that, yeah. uh, I think we're going to go ahead. No, so I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just I just wanted to say that you know I was I was kind of nervous doing this thing because this was me intentionally jumping into this thing as ignorant as possible, and um, we were sharing it with all you people out there that clearly love this series and are very passionate about it. So I was kind of worried that like. I was going to make myself look stupid or embarrass myself or um, be bringing up discussion points that have been brought up like a thousand times before. And everyone's like, you're not being insightful here, Scott. Duh. Um, so to me, the positive feedback that we received was just, it was so great. And I just wanted to say, we really appreciate that. We really appreciate you guys' passion um, for the series. And we hope that that translates to passion for us talking about it uh, because we i i really enjoyed last week's episode i think i'm gonna enjoy this one too so thank you guys thank you so much yeah we, we can't overstate the, the the positivity and the encouragement that we got from the feedback last week so uh without further ado we're gonna move on to the discussion of insinuation uh, so th- this arc was much longer than the than the first arc and i actually had to summarize my summary so um <laughs> as we're going through bear that in mind uh, so as we begin, uh, we essentially pick up right where we left off. Taylor wakes up in the morning uh, after her night of superheroing where she defeated Lung and she has breakfast with her dad and they chat. Uh, but she lies to him about what she was doing last night when he brings it up and she avoids opening up to him about her problems at school. And then she just kind of leaves. Um, so it's, it's essentially a, a discussion chapter between the two of them and we get to understand their relationship better. So how did you feel about this in general, Scott? Yeah, I, I like this a lot. Um, I think it's really cool that we we go right from um, a chapter in which we're in her father's point of view and we see how he describes himself, um, the type of person he thinks he is, and then we snap into this point of view where Taylor has a very specific and kind of mean uh, way of describing what her father looks like. Um, she says he's not what you call attractive. He is He's thin. He's got a weak chin. His hair's fallen out. Um and big glasses and he kind of looks um constantly bewildered like it's it's really interesting to me because we got this vision as we were in in his head last chapter like he was talking about his rage issues and i imagined quite a different looking person when reading his stuff so to see her perspective on it um was was interesting and i i I think it reinforces how much i like those interlude chapters and getting to jump into someone else's head uh however briefly is really advantageous to kind of figuring out um, how th- people look at things and how they perceive things in the story. Yeah, I think I think she perceives him very differently than how he perceives himself, and he perceives her very differently than how she perceives herself. And this is obviously part of the root of their failure to communicate here. Yeah, yeah. And and I also I really liked you know where Taylor draws the line as far as what she's okay with lying about and what she is still okay with lying about, but makes her feel bad. Um, Like, because, you know, there's moments where she says she feels like pangs of guilt as she lies, but it's only when, like, 
it was very specific lie. Like I think the 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 quote specifically were that was she told him she was going for a run and she said yes she had her uh, a mace with her and that was a lie because it was in her costume and that's what made her feel guilty. Whereas the other lies like are just kind of lies of omission, leaving something out, or kind of honesty by technicality. Like um, and and she doesn't seem as bothered with that kind of dishonesty. Um, it's just when she has to directly lie to him. Yeah, she's there's definitely um, I mean, it, it's interesting because she, she's doing, I think, what all teenagers do to some degree where they're yeah. kind of chafing and, and just trying to, to live their own lives. But also um, she's she has she has a good relationship with him. So she feels bad about it here and there. Um, but also she's really good at justifying herself, I think. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a general feature yeah. of her character. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's that that's kind of revealed in this chapter. And and I think it's starting to kind of see, you know, Taylor's opinion towards authority in general. Um and we kind of got a hint of it in the first arc, and this starts to reinforce it, and I think we're gonna see it a lot more going forward. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely the first example here where she just kind of shuts down and doesn't tell her dad anything at all, even though he's clearly offering the help. Yeah, yeah. And this is like, I think why Wild Bo is a good writer um, is because he can take a scene like this and he can do multiple things with the scene at the same time, right? So like in the scene, there's this throwaway conversation about how uh, Uber and Leet to gamer based superheroes which the image of that just made me laugh but um have recruited some guy that used to work with taylor's father and it seems like this really weird like throwaway conversation but it is doing things it's first of all it's teaching us about these two characters that are probably going to come into play later in the story but it's also like showing a disconnect between her and her father showing like how desperate he is to connect to her that he like grabs on some information that he thinks she might like um and just gives it to her and is of course completely shut down um because it doesn't it doesn't serve to uh start a conversation between the two of them at all right right and that's that's very good writing doing it that way cuz cuz exposition right exposition is boring but if you can find a way to layer it into um a different conversation where you don't actually realize that you're being uh, expounded to um, that's that's good writing yeah and one of my favorite things that wild Bo does uh, out of out of many things is that you you um when you're receiving new information in this kind of passive way it may be foreshadowing for something that's going to happen but it may also just be a tantalizing hint that the world is larger than these characters mm-hmm. and, and and i think that's really important like you know we, we've complained sometimes about how in, in star wars like the first movies are great because you get the sense that there's this vast world beyond it and then in the expanded universe they make a book about every single thing that's in the background of the movies and it <laughs> kind of kind of ruins the fact it kind of ruins the sense that there's a mystery um, and, and that there's like a vast scope to it um so what wild Bo does sometimes is he'll throw things in there that are that are almost just there to make you realize that there are things in the world that are beyond uh, the beyond what the characters are going to be grappling with. So I, and I think that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I think we'll see that in this arc itself. I mean, not just in this section, but there's throwaway lines to other superhero organization and supervillain organizations that um, we don't haven't heard about or don't know about, but it does. It makes the world feel bigger and more lived in. Yep, exactly. So moving on to the next chapter, Taylor goes to school and uses the school computers. Uh, I think she's in the middle of class, actually, to search uh, parahumans online, which is, of course, there would be a, a, a parahumans, you know, wiki forum website like Reddit. She's searching for information about the super villain villains she met last night. And, there, and she finds almost no information about them uh, except for bitch aka hellhound aka rachel lint who apparently her power is that she turns dogs into car-sized monsters um we learn a bit more about lung we let we see that he's been terrorizing the city and press ganging the whole asian population into the abb so it actually makes him seem quite a bit worse than he seemed in the first uh in the yeah, first arc yeah. <laughs> by learning this about him it's more like he's sort of a terrifying gang lord rather than just like a small-time thug and as she's looking at the website, she finds a message to Bug from TT, 
asking to meet and surmises that this is uh, from Tattletale trying to contact her. Uh, so this is a, this was kind of background chapter, but how did you feel about it in general? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quick, it's world building. Um, I, I had nothing to complain about it. I, I like, I like the detail of the parahumans wiki. <laughs> I just, I just like that it goes into that detail. Of course, there would be a way that you can explore and find information about superheroes just like there would be if they were alive uh, and right. existed in our world so th- these kind of details y- y- you're right just build this world and it, it makes it really cool um, and I like that that touch um, and, and I'm going to like it even more later in the, the arc when uh, we learn people are editing their own wiki pages to confuse people I, I like that touch um, yeah yeah that was hilarious yeah th- so the only thing I wanted to bring up here really isn't related to the section uh, specifically, but just that, you know, my uh, plan of attack for reading these things is I usually read through it once entirely, and then I read slash listen to the uh, the podcast audiobook that exists um, to kind of, so I can jot down notes as I'm reading. Um, and I did notice that there was a difference between what was recorded in the audiobook and what was printed on the page. So I know we talked last week about um, the wild boat was going through and editing thing. So it seems like he has come back through at least these sections and made edits. Um, and, and I wouldn't have realized that had I not been listening to that, uh, that podcast project. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not listening, so I'm not able to detect the discrepancies, but um, I, I'm definitely noticing more things this time through. And I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's because it's my second time and thus I'm tuned for different things or, if I'm actually reading different things. Um, yeah. But in any case, I thought this was an interesting chapter because I remember last week uh, you had said something along the lines of like the exposition is really well done because it's well integrated. And and this was closer to an exposition dump chapter in the sense that, mm-hmm. in, in the sense that it's her reading things and you're just sort of getting the information. But I, I still like the framing device of like, oh, you, you're learning that this world has like su- superhero websites. And it's just, it's it's like a delightful enough bit of um, bit of world building that I don't care at all that it's kind of an info dump. Do you feel the same at all? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, this is, you're absolutely right. This is exposition chapter. Um, but it, it, the framing device keeps it interesting. And it's it's better than... Uh, just either Taylor just relaying the information to us, the reader, or two people just having a conversation about it. Because not only is it giving us needed exposition, but it's doing cool things and building the world and building the characters a little bit. So, um, yeah. yeah, I didn't mind it. Um, and and I trust me when I say that I am a person who like hates exposition dumps. So the fact that I didn't mind this definitely says something about it. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same. So moving on to chapter three. Taylor goes to her next class and she has this class with the the bully Madison and Madison steals Taylor's homework and presents it as her own uh, in, in the class presentation. And the teacher, Mr. Gladly extends an offer to help to Taylor in private. Uh, but Taylor essentially thinks that help from authorities would just make the problem worse and has kind of a justification for it. And she turns down his help. Um, so, so th- this was interesting and this starts to show us, how Taylor thinks about authority in some more detail. What do you think about that, Scott? Yeah. I mean, we saw it a little bit in the first arc that the way, like the funny thing about Taylor is she tells you how she feels about people just by how she she describes how they look. Um, She's very blatantly. And, and, and again, this could be just a wild boast style of writing thing, or this could be very specifically we're so deep into Taylor's head that this is how, that information is relayed. These are the things she thinks about when she sees people, but she describes gladly um, very negatively in the first chapter, um, the first arc, it's kind of reinforced again here. And I actually thought some of this was a little repetitive on recharacterizing him. I don't know if that's changes in editing or what have you, but um, some of the same things were said about him that were said in the first arc. That's a very minor nitpick, but yeah, I mean, she, she does not like this guy and she doesn't like him for, seemingly ridiculous reasons like it's like oh he's trying to be friendly with the students um and he legitimately um is trying to help her out in the only way he knows how through through the system and um she just completely completely shuts him down um and i I think this is we get mention of an incident that happened earlier in the year um 
I don't think anything else is said about it. I don't, I'm going to assume that goes somewhere, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a safe assumption. I think, um, yeah, the, it, it's, it's interesting because Taylor has some very convoluted, but I think believable justifications for turning down his help here. I mean, I, I definitely had a smattering of, of what you could characterize as bullying experiences. And I definitely remember that it always seemed completely out of the question to tell any authority figure about it because I knew that just like Taylor says, they're not going to get like expelled. So all that means is I'm going to be stuck in the same situation with the person who's doing the whatever. And now they're going to hate me even more. So, um, it's, this is her justification. And like, as an adult with kids, even I'm tempted to be like, no, of course you should tell your, of course you should tell your parents. Of course you should tell the authorities. They, of course they can help. But I can totally remember thinking exactly what Taylor's thinking in this, in this scene as she, as she's like, no, don't, don't bother doing anything. You can't do anything to help me. Um, very, very, very teenager and, and understandable mentality. Yeah, but I I think at least until next chapter, you can't really blame him because like he as his authority role can only use the avenues that he has available to him. And you're right, the, the the big issue with bullying, and I think we'll get into this a little more in a bit, is that there's no real easy answer to how to stop it. Um, but um, he is kind of in a, in a situation where all he can do is, with her blessing, report it or. Um, go through those formal channels and you're right that doesn't fix the problem but what what else can he do um maybe notice her a bit more i don't know like i I kind of feel bad for him in this situation too because he's trying like he's extending the olive branch to her and she's she's batting it away right it's not clear what she wants from him exactly because she's clearly resentful of him yeah but then he offers the help and she says no so um and she kind of she wants him to help Right. I, I mean, but she just doesn't think he can. Yeah. Let's. Let, why don't we move ahead to the next yeah, chapter because it kind of yeah. seg. It's, it kind of segues into this yeah. discussion. So, so once she goes outside the classroom, and you know, leaves Mister Gladly behind, a large group of girls, including Madison, Emma, and Sophia, at the core, surround Taylor and kind of corner her against the wall. Uh, so, as they're mocking her and just being horrible to her, she considers physically attacking them to get them to back down but she kind of calculates that this would only make things worse and that it wouldn't be viewed as standing up for herself. What would probably actually happen is the girls would like twist it to be a story about Taylor attacking them aggressively and getting her in much bigger trouble. Um, And it's interesting to me that Taylor sort of characterizes this as being a difference between uh, like a gender difference in bullying. Um, So one thing Scott, you and I had, had, had talked about at this point was is this Wildbo's opinion or is this Taylor's opinion? And I think that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Because, yeah. Cause, cause I don't actually have a good answer as to like, are there really such gender differences in bullying? I, I know that as a, as a male, I was definitely able to put a stop to some like attempted bullying by being physical, but um, I don't really have any insight into how that works with girls. Um, yeah. I think, you know, when I first read this, I, th- my first thought was this is wild bow making a statement. But the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like this is specifically something that Taylor herself thinks, because we were talking earlier about how Taylor um, is, is very good at justifying something to herself, whether it's action or inaction. So um, I read this as something that she thinks is true. I don't know, like from a, from an actual real world standpoint, if that's a true assumption. I mean, it seems like oversimplification. Like I'm sure there are guys that would get in a fight where where one guy, after getting punched, would go run and twist a story to make him look like the victim, even though even if he was instigating. So I don't think that's something you can literally draw at the sex line. Um, but it also makes a lot of sense for why Taylor herself might think that. Yeah. So the conclusion is that violence is the answer. Um, <laughs> so at the end of this bullying session, Emma uh, brings up that Taylor's mom is dead, which is how we find that out uh, as a weapon so just to make up. her feel bad. Yeah. So fucked up. Which finally breaks Taylor's composure. Um, and uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it breaks her composure, but in a, it's, it's not like a I lose my shit and use my powers to to um to rain terror on these girls. It's like literally just she wasn't able to hide the fact that the things that were they were doing were destroying her. Um, right. Yeah, she's she's remarkable. Like the, probably the saddest thing about this. And I should mention that this comes across as very sad and like heartbreaking as you're reading it. But like the saddest part about it is how it's clear that she's been dealing with this for a long time because she's like, yeah, yeah, they've I've been cornered by a group of girls who are just treating me horrifically and like ripping things out of my hands. And I'm just kind of sitting here silently and taking it and trying to avoid showing any reaction because I know that's what they're after. And it's like, oh, my God, that's so heartbreaking. That, that that you're in this position um yeah yeah I, I forgot to i forgot to mention somewhere along the line that mr gladly walks out of the classroom sees what's happening and then just sadly walks away and taylor is taylor's like oh like internally in disbelief that he would do that but she did just tell him not to intervene so it, it, this is an interesting little tidbit there yeah so this is where gladly lost me though because i understand like he reached out, she shut him away. So his reaction is to see her very clearly getting bullied and say, well, she didn't want my help, but also you're a teacher, you're a position of authority. You have the ability to make a judgment call and say, despite someone's uh, outward feeling of you can't help me. If you see people like bullying on a person, you have to step in. Like you have to do it. Like that's his job. So I, I, I get yeah. why he did it, but it's like, dude, you got, you're a teacher. You got to, you got to be better than that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, yeah. As a, as a grown up, you just have to be the grown up. I think. Right. Uh, and this, I mean, but this all leads into Taylor's just general feeling that authority and authoritarian figures just let her down, um, that she can't rely on them, that she is truly on her own in this whole thing. Um, and that she's desperately reaching out to find someone that, um, that will that will uh, support her and be there with her, um, and she so far hasn't been able to find it. Yeah, and exactly. I, and I, like speaking about the, like this, the story, and, and to to follow up on what we said, we were going to talk about this thing thematically. So we're going to keep <laughs> keep track on that. You know, everything we've read so far can be seen as just a story about bullying, right? Um, mm-hmm. From you know, like you use superpowers as a way to express um you know the power that some people have over each other and through bullying and and i was thinking about it today and i really liked the idea of her powers as like a a manifestation of how she feels her place in the world is that she feels like she's a, a bug underneath all these people that are just stepping on her and ignoring her and not considering her and i think that's really poignant um and i'm I'm convinced that that, that that's going to be where this story goes more. And I'm really looking forward to getting there. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely, I'm, I'm not going to give you any, any hints or, or indication, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm going to suggest that we keep paying attention to, to that type of thinking as we go forward. Yeah. Um, I, this is where I'm glad that we're not recording in the same room because I don't want to see like smirks on your face as I say things. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, when we're on, when we're on G chat, I'm very frequently just like, <laughs> How do I respond to this without giving any indication of whether he's right? But anyway, um, moving on. Uh, so, yes, Emma is horrible. And eventually, uh, pretty much right after this, they steal her backpack. I think Sophia grabs her backpack. And Taylor just le- just runs at that point, leaving behind her backpack and her books and, and everything. And, she, and, I, and I believe it's like not even the end of the day. So she's basically just no it's like because it was it's lunchtime right because that one yeah. class she had with gladly is is right before lunchtime so yeah she yeah. skipped school again yeah right and and who knows how long this has been happening where she's basically just missing tons of school due to this bullying problem and not telling anyone about it so yeah moving on to the next chapter taylor just goes to the public library and she uses a computer at the library to respond to tattletale's message which you know she's decided to do because she's so emotional right now basically and then tattletale quickly responds on the public forum to ask to meet her at the site of the lung fight and also hints that she knows that taylor is at the library 
Uh, so it's a pretty pretty short chapter, actually. It's essentially comprised of her kind of mental reaction to this bullying incident, and then and then this back and forth exchange with Tattletail. And uh, of course, she's kind of freaked out by the whole idea that Tattletail knows where she is because she's trying to be all sneaky. So, yeah, how, yeah, how do you feel about this? Yeah, so <laughs> it's funny because I, I like this on one level because it, she immediately leaves this situation where her former best friend just did this terrible thing to her and these people are awful and she has no one to turn to when she's all on her own. And her first reaction, no matter how ridiculous it is, is to reach out to literally the only person in her life that has extended any sort of um, need or want for her, um, which is happens to be people that are quote unquote supervillains um, that are the bad guys that she is supposed to be fighting against. So like that's, that's very much, in line with Taylor's psyche right now is that like, she is so desperate that she's going to reach out to these people kind of regardless of the danger of it too. Um, like I, I, I did want to say, I really think it's funny that as soon as she finds out that, uh, that the person knows she's in the library, her response is like, was my computer hacked or something? And this is like a world where superpowers exist. So I'm kind of confused as to why your brain wouldn't just go, Oh, she might have a power that lets her know that. Um, but I think it kind of shows how, how like desperate and reckless she's being, um, by just formulating these plans seemingly without really thinking anything through and then just going through it. And she's still being some level of careful because she's not a stupid person, but, um, she's willing to overlook dangers because she needs this interaction so badly. Yeah. I think some of her behavior in this chapter could also be plausibly explained by her getting two hours of sleep the previous night. (laughs) That's Um, true. Yeah. Um, but part of me, part of me wonders if like, cause I know they mentioned that several times. They said, maybe it's just a lack of sleep or blah, blah, blah. But part of me thinks that's Taylor once again, rationalizing to herself. It's like, I'm behaving recklessly. Oh, it's just cause I'm tired. Um, yeah. or, is, or is it this or that? And, and her lack of, their seeming lack of awareness towards, uh, what her real subconscious motivations are. Yeah, that, that's a great that's a great way of phrasing it, that she has a lack of self-awareness. And that's not something that I believed about her the first time through, because her internal narration of her existence comes across as very strong. And it actually makes her very likable, because she's rarely, like, overtly self-pitying. Um, but, but she is actually in a really terrible place mentally. It, it's just like she's she's holding it together, you know? And, right. And that actually makes her admirable, but it's like, yeah, man, but you really need to kind of address the fact that you're in a terrible place right now, Taylor. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and again, I think this is where the first person's perspective really aids in this kind of stuff, right? Because we're seeing Taylor's mind's eye, basically. So, like, we literally, as we're reading, see that she will refuse to think about the bad thing that just happens to her. Like, she actively avoids thinking about things that make her uncomfortable. So, we're literally actively seeing her survival mechanism in process as she copes with all the, the terrible things that are being done to her. And that's that's like that's why I think the decision was, let's do this first person, because we're in her brain. We are her yeah yeah and 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 while she's trying to sort of pretend to herself like like what those girls did doesn't bother her so much and she's going to get over it actions speak louder than words and her action is to go reach out to a gang of supervillains yeah exactly exactly so speaking of which in the next chapter 2.6 taylor decides that she's going to go to the meeting uh, because, well, she justifies it as, you know, she needs to do what she told Arms. She needs to help Arms Master. She's going to gather information about these villains so that she can she can help the good guys. She decides, though, that she's going to wear her armor and her, and her mask because she doesn't, you know, she doesn't really know what's up yet. Um, and as she's heading to the meeting, we get, a, we get like an understanding of the capacity and the limitations of the sensory aspect of her power because she's, she's approaching the building. She's using her bugs to scout ahead. And, and it kind of says how like she, she relies on kind of the spatial sense of the power to get a sense of where things are. And it, it's, it's like disorienting to rely on the bugs vision, but she can do it. And I think she can sort of hear through them, but it's like weird or something. I don't remember the detail exactly, but it's interesting to get a picture of how it's not it's not really like a nice, clean human sensory experience, but it is useful to her. Yeah, I think she said the hearing was basically like, it, it was almost overpowering where it was just too much information. So she has to like turn it off most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the, the sense I got at least. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she goes up to the rooftop and the undersiders are there and they're all wearing their civilian clothes and they all get delightful introductions and they have delightful banter, which if if we didn't point that out last week, I think that one of Wildo's number one skills is delightful banter between characters. <laughs> um, they give her uh, a lunchbox, an Alexandria lunchbox full of money. And they're basically telling her to either take it as a token of goodwill or to accept it as her first paycheck as a member of their team. So they're, they're offering her a job. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> this, uh, first of all, the example, once again, of Taylor using how she describes people as um, a way of telling us how she feels about them, because we get this, uh, this, this, picture of what Gru looks like um and she she wants this dude <laughs> i don't know what's gonna happen in the future but it's very clear like she's like dressing him up and down um it it's really funny um and she does not do the same to regent at all so yeah. I, I i love i love those kind of details like that i mean it's really fun yeah yeah and and, and simultaneously doesn't think to herself like he's hot it's just it's just like every detail that she that she thinks to point yeah. out is is like that's a super attractive choice yeah <laughs> um yeah and i really i really like how the money's given to her in this lunchbox um just the the the, the symbol of this uh kind of either a bribe or like hush money um being placed in the lunchbox that belongs to like a super famous uh, superhero um and like i think it, i think it said it was her favorite um yeah, alexandria said, her fa- yeah. favorite and then yeah. <laughs> the, the adorableness of her first reaction to being given this before she actually opens it is just like is is it a is it a collectible like i it just made me laugh like i think you know there's there's kind of a way we can forget that these are children still. I mean, they're teenagers, but they're, they're very young. And it's like stuff like that, that you remind is like, Oh yeah, these are, these are kids. Like this is, this, and it's, it's just funny. I like the detail. Yeah. yeah the, the Alexandria lunchbox line is, is one of my favorites. Um, so as she's talking to the undersiders, they reveal to her that she almost killed lung actually, uh, which is, um, surprising to her and and i think surprising to us too because we kind of had this sense that he has this healing factor and but they basically explain that she bit him like an absurd number of times with black widows and he has like severe tissue necrosis over most of his body and specifically like will be sitting down to use the bathroom for some time his dick fell off is what yeah yeah that's what i'm that's exactly what i'm saying (laughs) and uh which which is which obviously assuming he makes it through is going to make him a little bit disgruntled towards her. Yeah. Um, so remember um, back at the beginning of last podcast where I talked about how I liked that her power was seemingly weaker than what like a normal, like protagonist in a superhero story's power would be. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry to Taylor and I'm sorry to everyone that was listening. Cause damn, that's a, uh, you don't really think about it, right? You don't think about, yeah, these are incredibly, dangerous uh, bugs that uh, can do a lot of damage yeah i mean it, it's i think what we said before holds true where like the fact that she her like her own body is just a normal body it, it's it's a point of vulnerability and so that's a nice it's nice to have weaknesses like that otherwise it gets boring yeah but but yeah like you you don't quite think through unless you're motivated you don't quite think through the ramifications of being able to control what at this point we don't even know if there's a limit like just an arbitrary number of bugs um and and, and any kind of bug including stinging and biting and you know etc yeah and and more importantly taylor doesn't think through it um because like all throughout the the arc so far we've seen her have a very good command of her power she knows how to use them pretty well um but she still hasn't fully thought out or understood um the actual consequences they can have um, and that, again, goes back to this idea that, you know, she's still young, she's still a kid, and she's not fully um, thought about the consequences of everything that she does. Yeah. Yeah, just to skip ahead minutely, we, we, we're going to see in a, in a little bit that she does a lot with it unconsciously, Yeah, actually. And, uh, and it, that obviously has consequences, but it's like, okay, well, what is it doing unconsciously? Um, 
and 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 like how much of her control is is sort of intentional versus how much is she's giving it a vague direction to do things in and it's obliging her. Like we don't, we don't know. We don't really have answers to these questions at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And how potentially dangerous that can be. Right. Right. Uh, it's mentioned in this scene that the undersiders have a mysterious boss who brought them together and pays them to stay together. Um, so who knows where this is going to go? Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's hinted earlier when she's like walking through the streets and trying to think of which one of them is the leader. Um, but mm-hmm can't really come to a conclusion because it doesn't seem like any of them would be the leader. So this is, yeah, just, just some foreshadowing thrown in here. Yeah. I'm really curious yeah. if you're wondering at home, I really want to know who this is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't know. I don't know, Scott. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so Taylor reasons based on all of this, that she just, she's going to accept their offer to join the team because otherwise she's not going to learn any useful information to pass on to the PRT. And, uh, and so she's, uh, she's going in, she's going in to join the undersiders. Um, we'll just move on because I think we talked about that as we went through it, basically. Uh, so of course the first thing they do is they're like, all right, take off your mask, which she somehow managed not to entirely realize was, ne- <laughs> was necessary. Again, I, I kind of chalk this part up to like sleep deprivation and, and being a bit overwhelmed because it's, it's a really intense situation actually. So she kind of, you know, they give her some privacy. She takes off her costume, puts on some normal clothes, and we see how crappy her self-esteem is. Um, Scott, how likely do you think it is that she's being fair to herself here? I mean, she, there's no way she's being fair to herself. Um, it, it's self-deprecation because for the first time in what is perceivably a while, she has people that are actually interested in who she is. Um, and there she's worried that she's kind of afraid at any moment that she could scare them off. And like, I think this is very important because um, she uh, is doing this to infiltrate their group. Like in her mind, what she's telling herself and, and therefore telling us is she's breaking into this group because she wants to infiltrate it because she wants to bust all these supervillains. So the fact that she, for some reason, cares about what they think um, is really telling about what her actual state of mind is right now. Right. Especially when, when, uh, Tattletail, who we learned her real name is Lisa, gives Taylor a hug when Taylor gives her name, and that Taylor like greatly appreciates this hug far beyond what is, you know, it, it's just kind of heartbreaking how much she appreciates the hug. Yeah, and it's like oh, it's yeah, it's so going to be uh, yeah, it's like yeah, this is the group you're trying to insinuate yourself with. <laughs> 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 so uh, they go they go back to the undersiders. Uh, layer at this point and i d- i think there's some pretty cool like further scene setting as they're walking through brockton bay and you're seeing how dilapidated and run down it is and how everything is covered in graffiti and it's all rusted and there's just this like abandoned warehouse which is their um their lair so i th- i think that's interesting because in the first chapter we were we were saying that it was kind of like the every city uh this th- i mean the first arc this arc I feel makes it seem a bit more dystopian, not, not like ostentatiously, but like, it seems like a pretty bad city by this description. Do you agree or, or am I overreaching with this? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think every city has bad parts to it, right? I do agree that the bad parts to it are described in much more detail here to, I mean, it's, it's really bad. Um, but I, I, I I hesitate to say that like this is and and that the city is completely run because it's it seems like the boardwalk area and the downtown area are are in fairly good condition right it's just this one section of town um which I think every city kind of has that um and maybe it's way worse here than others because there are super villains running around but um I don't know uh, yeah I mean you know you know more than I do so no I I was I genuinely wasn't trying to inject any any opinions there it, it's it's more like just I, I think you're exactly right actually it's it's probably just like it's like any city except the bad part maybe is is a worse bad part because it has super villain gangs um but it's like you said it still has a gentrified area yeah, yeah. so they go to this to the hangout which is which is described in some detail 
and uh, they're, they're just chatting. Taylor impresses Brian by seeming humble and eager to learn. I mean, there's there's a lot of detail and nuance and back and forth in the character interactions here. So, Scott, anytime you want to jump in with a, with a tidbit of a reaction, feel free. I just want to say this loft is really cool, and I kind of want to live there. Except yeah. I'd probably make them clean up. You know what? It's, it's funny, because when I read this part, do you remember the original Ninja Turtles movie? The, yes, like the first one from the 80s? Remember when they, like, have that warehouse where all the, like, the ruffian kids hang out where like <laughs> for some reason i just thought of it like that which i know oh, it's man. not um because that that's was funny. so freaking 80s and ridiculous yeah. but that's just like the thought of like just, just maybe not it looks exactly like that but like the feel of it like this is a place where like kids are allowed to do whatever they want without supervision um so it's going to be kind of dirty there's going to be like probably like video games everywhere and and just like people doing whatever they want um and so i had a very clear image of that in my head yeah i mean as a as a former teenager it sounds like heaven (laughs) um yeah but i do i do appreciate how taylor specifically calls out that there is no adult supervision here because again she she hates authority she hates um any kind of authority figure so the fact that she appreciates that is is noted Yes, right. It's it's a haven specifically because it's free from authority. Exactly. So in the course of the discussions, she learns what Tattletail's power actually is, and it's described as superpowered intuition, which fills in the gaps in her knowledge. And obviously, this is a huge risk to Taylor because she's trying to infil- infiltrate the group, and uh, it's a little bit risky to have somebody around who just sort of knows things she shouldn't know. Um, yeah, she's she's being really dumb here, Matt. <laughs> yeah, like it's, and yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It's I was I was just gonna say. I mean, speaking of, I mean, I, I think we're gonna have plenty of opportunity to talk about Tattletail's power and powers like hers. Um, but I just want to say, like, this is a particularly weak seeming power because not only like it has no physical manifestation at all. You know, even. Even Marvel telepaths can usually like sh- shoot a psychic blast or or control someone's body or something. But as far as as far as we know, Tattletail just has this. She's just like a normal person, except she kind of knows things she shouldn't know. So it's it's a, a cool example of of a really weak seeming power in this world. Um, but uh, obviously, we're going to see whether that's true or not. Yeah, I like how nebulous it is. It kind of adds some mystery and suspense to it, especially since uh, Taylor is continuing to act without really thinking and <laughs> really rashly. Um, and, and I wanted to bring that up just because I remember last week you talked to me about how you thought her jumping into battle um, seemed like so surprising. And to me, it just kind of this how she's acting all throughout this arc reinforces that that she's like she's she's acting quickly she thinks she's thinking things out but i don't think she is because she's just gotten herself in this really bad situation um and now she's kind of stuck in it right um yeah and you know it's just dumb like (laughs) she's she's in trouble yeah her, her approach tends to be that if she's in a bad situation she'll take a big risk which may make the situation worse in order to try to get out of the bad situation. Yeah. Um, if that makes sense. I think we see some manifestations of that. So Absolutely. kind of abruptly and out of nowhere, Taylor is then attacked by a pack of dogs at the end of this chapter, like in the middle of their loft, which is shocking and surprising. And of course you turn the page because you Clear don't know what's going to happen there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, what we find out happened, of course, in 2.8 is that Bitch has come back because she, I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but she wasn't with the group when they arrived. And this was because she uh, didn't want Taylor to join. She she had voted against Taylor joining. So, so she's kind of mad that Taylor is back in the loft and that Taylor is now part of the team. So, she's arrived and she sicked her dogs in their normal, non-superpower form on Taylor and they're sort of cornering her against the wall and being pretty vicious, like, like actually biting her and drawing blood. And it's, it's a, it's a cool, like very chaotic and intensely written scene with Brian shouting for, for a bitch to call off the dogs. And, and she, she isn't doing it for quite some time. And then finally Brian punches bitch in the face and that causes her to 
call off the dogs. Um, and Taylor is, you know, the, the other two heroes, Regent and Tattletail, kind of help Taylor up. And she realizes that this time there's no reason she can think of that she shouldn't retaliate. You know, and, and she's obviously still in the frame of mind that she just was, you know, an hour or so ago when when she was cornered by these bullies and and, and harassed. Um, and we see that she's been unconsciously gathering a huge number of bugs that are now waiting outside the windows. So that's an interesting little tidbit about her power there. So she brings them flowing into the room and then just charges bitch and starts beating the crap out of her and knocks her down and starts kicking her in the face and the ribs. Um which is pretty vicious. Uh, any any comments at this point? Yeah, I mean, I kind of want to talk about all this at once um, because yeah, okay. I just I love the scene. I think no matter what happens in the rest of this uh, book, I think this right here shows Wild Bo's skill as a writer. Um, it's just so well constructed, and the fact that you know this is very, very intentionally calling back to the confrontation she had with Emma just a few hours earlier. I mean, even, even in physical setup, right? Because, um, in both Taylor finds herself suddenly surrounded by the underlings of, of the person in charge, whether it be Emma or bitch, um, they're there merely to hurt her. Um, I think bitch actually specifically says, you know, I gave them the command to hurt, not kill. Um, so like, it's literally just people exerting their power on her for no intention other than to cause her pain. Um, and that is like, it's, it's just so well constructed that like you can see this connection, this through line between these two things. And it ties this theme of bullying to how we're going to tell this story of bullying through superheroes and supervillains and superpowers. Um, and I just, I love that. I love the detail in that. It's just so well done. Yeah. And and that specifically, she she can't she can't be she can't be a superpowered person in the first context. So she just has to eat it. Whereas in this context, she's she's able to be her her super self, and, and right. she so she uses her power. Although interestingly, doesn't attack bitch with the bugs. She just she just uses the bugs as a screen to keep the dogs at bay while she just beats the crap out of bitch with her hands and feet. Yeah, and there's something kind of scary here, right? I mean, we know Taylor's father has anger issues. Um, we know that she's had this pent up frustration and anger for a while that she just hasn't been able to unleash. And we're seeing it all unleashed at once. Um, and that if this has got to be something to Taylor, that just feels so freeing to her that she finally gets to do this, that she finally gets to retaliate against these people that have been hurting her. And it's, it's kind of scary. I mean, like that, that can be very intoxicating to feel this freedom. Yeah. You can use this power. She has power. There's no repercussion for her power. Um, we don't even see her really get punished by anything she does. In fact, um, Brian kind of lets her out of the hook and says, you deserved everything that you got, Rachel. So um, this is very tempting for her. Yeah. 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 So, so Brian, Brian basically breaks up the fight with his power, uh, which, which we see is some kind of amorphous cloud of, of absolute darkness and sensory deprivation that descends over over them as they're fighting and it confuses Taylor enough that she backs off and, uh, and, and kind of, then, then she gets really mad and she tries to leave. Um, and, and basically says that she feels, she feels rejected and, and that causes her to understand that she actually wanted to be accepted by these guys, which we kind of knew <laughs> at this point yeah, yeah. It, um, because of the hug mainly. But, but now she's like, kind of feels really crestfallen and, and beat down about it. Um, and of course, um, of course, at that point, Brian slash Gru convinces her um, to come back. Does that happen in the next chapter? Or is no, it's this? it's at the end of this one. Yeah, so he, um, he he yeah he convinces her to come back, which I think is an easy sell because as as we pointed out, she's actually pretty desperate for this type of human companionship, and she also wants to bang him. Yes, but no, I I. I Again, this this parallels with the the scene before where the, uh, 
Mr. Gladly, the teacher, saw her saw her in this situation and and backed off or and just walked away. Um, Brian instead punches bitch in the face. Brian intervenes. Brian sticks up for her. Brian supports her. So of course she's going to go back with him. Like of course she's going to reach out to this person who finally was there for her. It just it's so logical and makes so much sense based on everything we've known about her character. Um, and that's just it's just so. It's so well done, man. I really like yeah. this. Uh, this yeah. chapter is just awesome. Yeah, it's it's a perfect construction. It really is. I don't know the word for this. Um, I don't know if there is a word, but but it it feels like there should be a word for this technique. Um, if, if there's not, then we'll have to make one up. Um, <laughs> Wild poetism. Yeah, it's a, it's well. There's too many. There's too many good things he does <laughs> for us to like, wild boism a, and then we'll just have all right. We'll a keep through, a running tally. Through. We're gonna need yeah. a glossary. Yeah, we'll we'll trust our listeners to take care of this for us. Um, just one one note about her anger to loop back around for a second before we move forward um, is that like she, at least to me, like the way she's written, her her outburst and her attack on Rachel seems very calculated, and like even though it's sort of clear that she is overwhelmed with like fury while she's doing this in in her mind it's like it's like justified like sh- she's she's thinking through how like where best to kick her to cause damage and and to make sure she can't retaliate like she's sort of very coldly thinking through the violence of it so it's not just like a blind fury where she's lashing out it's it's i, I think that's an interesting thing to note that she's even in even when she's having like a rage she's it's like a cold efficient rage and uh yeah at least that's how i read it no that's a really good point uh that's not something i had really thought about before but as soon as you mentioned i'm like yeah i mean she never really loses control i mean just just by the fact that she doesn't actually sick her bugs on a uh, bitch shows that she didn't really ever lose complete control like literally she just uses her powers as a defensive thing to keep the dogs away from her and then just is physically beating her um yeah. so yeah she definitely is not like fully out of out of control yeah yeah okay so yeah she comes back upstairs and uh next chapter 2.9 uh we see that bitch remains cowed from her attack and regent actually now seems to respect her a bit while he was being like pretty dismissive toward her prior to this and just kind of didn't seem to care that she was there one way or the other. Now he actually is kind of talking to her and, and treating her better. And uh, you can't help but interpret this as like him approving of her showing her violent side. <laughs> yeah. Let's remember that these are bad guys or yeah. villains, at least criminals. Right. Yeah. So, so we get a scene of Brian stitching up both Rachel and Taylor of their, of their injuries that they just gave each other as they're kind of sitting side by side. And, uh, you know, that's, that's fun to me because how many times does somebody get stitches in a Marvel or DC movie ever? Yeah. Um, and we were talking about this earlier, but I really like that level of detail because like so much in these superhero movies where pe- people's powers aren't like super strong, strong skin or like super strength. They just have a very specific power, but yet they like get punched by a super strong guy or thrown into a wall or something like that. And there's like no repercussions for them. So the fact that like we're reinforcing that, Hey, these guys have a very specific skill set, and they're also just human beings that when you punch them, they bleed. Yeah, if you kick them in the ear, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> their ear might kind of start to tear off a little bit. So, yeah, be, be a little bit careful there, Taylor. Um, so, keeping a tab on the superpowers as we're learning about them, we learned that uh, Regent can get it, like, quote, get into people's nervous systems. And he, he demonstrates that by making brian trip and spasm and fall down as he's walking across the room uh which of course leads brian to tackle him playfully and we just get more delightful characterization and and banter uh and Mm -hmm. also this is that this is that part where brian admits that he edited his wikipedia or not wikipedia but you know parahuman wikipedia to to describe his power as darkness generation even though that's a pretty incomplete and misleading description of what it does because it's more like, as Taylor described, it's like a complete sensory deprivation field. And another thing that we find out from him is that he doesn't seem to see the darkness. Like he, he can just see through it as if it's not there and everyone else is staggering around blind. So yeah. that has uh, cool uses, I think. And I think one of the most important details in here that's so like minorly thrown in there is the fact that Tattletale um, 
can tell the full extent of what his powers do. Stuff that he didn't even know he had, she, like, her power can tell her that. And in this world of um, people using powers so secretively and, like, holding back what their full potential is, that seems very important and very powerful. Um, and it's just kind of thrown out there kind of cleverly to where you might not even pick up on it. Yeah, yeah. And and that's that's astute to pick up on because, uh, I mean, we're, we're at this point, we're trying to put together, like, wh- where did these undersiders come from? Why is it that Arms Master knows nothing about them? Why is it that their their Wikipedia entries are, are mostly blank? Um, and elements like, okay, well, one of them just magically seems to know things. Um, like, for example, you know, puts into better context the fact that in the previous arc, uh, they 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 seem to know that lung was coming after them you have to assume that this was factored in there somehow yeah and i think we know the all these guys power sets now right and besides uh bitch which is like i hate having to say her name over and over again it's really <laughs> weird but anyway let's say hellhound like yeah uh, let's like, say let's like the that. good guys yeah i'll yeah. say hellhound uh, anyway um their powers on the surface like don't seem that powerful right i mean like like i think taylor even mentions it once when she learns about regents making people fall down power and she's like what that doesn't seem very useful um so i i really like that there's this team of people that on the surface maybe they're they don't have the most useful quote-unquote powers but um once you start delving into the detail and the depths of what they can do you can see how actually powerful it can get and i'm assuming that's going to happen you know going forward yeah you almost have to ask if when wild bow was kind of conjuring up the, the way to do this he took some of the more weak seeming powers to give to his his uh intro team that he's that he's introducing us to here so that mm-hmm. we could see the unusualness of them because really each of these is very different from anything we've ever seen in in yeah, like marvel yeah, and dc I, I think because marvel and dc is almost always like super strength durability and some kind of beam and then maybe <laughs> maybe regeneration and maybe psychic mumble mumble um and i mean I'm, I'm maybe being a little bit unfair but like you know controlling a huge cloud of bugs is like w- once you hear about it it's like wow that would be awesome that'd be an awesome power why is that not a why is that not a popular, you know, DC hero? I think there may be a DC hero who does that, but I don't think they're popular. So Probably not. Yeah. yeah. And I love how this chapter ends with Taylor calling her dad to tell her to tell him that she's going to be spending the night with these guys. And uh, as she's talking, she sees a handgun on the table, and the chapter ends. They seem like good people. I lied. Just love that touch. Yeah. Like, look the it's so clever here because like we've spent the entirety of this arc almost leading up to her moment of finally, she's found people she can get along with uh, hellhound excluded, but, um, and finally people that like accept her and seem to like her. And then like, there's that bam juxt- juxtaposition right at the end that say, Hey, remember the, these are criminals. Like these people are nice to you. Yeah. Um, but they do things that are opposite of the things you said you wanted to do. Um, and it's just, it's just perfect. It's perfectly done. Like, I love how it drops like that. And you're right. That finishing on that quote, um, just wonderful. Um, yeah. Leaves a nice pit in your stomach. Yeah. 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 You're in over so, your yeah. head. You're in over your head, Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. Just stop making decisions and hold on for a minute. So that's, that's the end of the Taylor, the Taylor part. Um, I guess we can we can move ahead to the interlude chapter and then loop back around if we feel like it. Yeah, yeah. The the interlude chapter is Victoria, um, whose superhero name is Glory Girl, and we haven't seen her at all yet at this point. We haven't even heard her name mentioned, I don't think. Uh, but she's a more kind of standard superhero. She has the power of flight and super strength, and an added ability to sort of project an aura that makes people around her feel in awe of her. And she's chasing down this unpowered skinhead thug and just kind of like toying with him, like like a really embarrassing cat and mouse game where she's just like zipping past him and hitting him and like throwing him. And he's just like a normal person. So he's getting horribly maimed. And at one point, she he like says something rude. So 
she just like throws in what's described as like 20 yards or something <laughs> yeah and where he like hits a dumpster she kicks um, a dumpster at him yeah yeah so so scott here we meet our first hero with a more superman like power set um but as a person she's not really anything like superman what, what do you what do you feel about this yeah so again going into the theme of juxtaposition um this entire arc we've seen people who are bad guys and had them seem kind of not that bad um and now here at the end in this interlude we see a person who's supposed to be good guy um and seems kind of bad so that's really clever juxtaposition it's a really smart way of ending this whole thing up um i think this is you know reinforcing this whole um authority might not be so cut and dry good type of thing um because this person is seems pretty pretty terrible (laughs) yeah seems to be abusing her authority a bit absolutely yeah she she ends up calling her adoptive sister amy and begs her to use her healing powers on the thug so her her adoptive sister apparently has healing powers uh, because explicitly because victoria doesn't want to get in trouble it's not like she's like afraid that she's hurt him or killed him yeah yeah well and i think the smart thing here is that they made this be a white supremacist who was part of a group that beat the shit out of a black girl so like it it, and i think that's intentional it's very clearly what this guy did was wrong there's not any kind of moral um gray area on that like what he did was wrong but that doesn't mean that she gets to just act go punish her yeah yeah exactly like like she is part of a system and has to abide by the rules and laws of the system. And she seems completely unwilling to do that. She's using her powers to get away and, and uh, her sister's powers to circumvent the rules of the system to do what she wants. Yeah. And, and somehow her sister manages or, or the combination of Victoria and her sister managed to be even more screwed up when they're together because they eventually kind of, get the thug to to give them information they want because as she's healing him she's like also kind of messing with his body and causing like weird numbness and and weird sensations and telling him that that he's going to be impotent because of like what she's doing yeah um and so he ends up giving them an info dump about the current state of the cape scene in brockton bay including a lot of names and details that i'm not even going to list here um but the upshot is that taking long out of the picture has actually badly messed up the balance of power. And now the skinhead, the skinhead gang that he's part of called empire 88 is making a, a play for power. So that's, uh, that's pretty much how it ends. Yeah. So first of all, I think it was interesting. What's the name of the, her sister, uh, the healer girl. I can't remember Amy. 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 What's her superpower name? Uh, I'm not sure if they tell you, but I'm, I, I think can they tell do. you it's, they do. It's, panis- it's panacea. Okay. Yeah. They, she has her use it. Yeah. So I think it is very w- interesting that she comes off as the good one, right? Like she comes in, she's annoyed. It's like, you went too far. She seems to be one that's like arguing for following this, following the letter of the law and doing what you're supposed to. But by the end of it, she's kind of just as bad as he is, or as her sister is. Um, and yeah. I thought that was really surprising and interesting. Um, and yeah, then like, yeah, yeah, sorry. Go she, ahead. I was just going to say she, she messes with his head. Well, well, right. Well, glory girl messes with his body. And that's even the last line that, that, uh, glory girl says is like, Oh, Oh, Amy, you said you weren't going to mess with people's heads or something like something along those lines. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. <laughs> we cannot be stopped right exactly yeah we're we're monsters yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so and i i also appreciate the power vacuum thing because obviously i i know i'm getting into an epic story here um and this is kind of setting the stage for like look the instigating factor of everything that's going to happen for the next one million words um mm-hmm. is taylor taking out this lung guy so um, I think that you get the feeling this kind of opens you up to the, the scope of everything that's going to be happening and kind of the grandness of this is the inci- the the initial incident and it's going to kind of snowball from here. So yeah, I thought that was would, cool. Is this the end of act one moving into act two of a, of a five act structure? Uh, it, could, I didn't, it could be. Um, it's hard I to, didn't. it's hard to label that without reading the other yeah, four that's acts. True. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, 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 that's probably a little bit premature considering how, few words we actually are into this yeah uh, yeah 
Yeah. I, I mean, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is it feels like that. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. It's like the stages are set, pieces are moving. I just quoted yeah. Lord of the Rings without even yeah. realizing it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, huh, that felt really organic. Um, yeah. So that's that's arc two insinuation and things are things are ramping up it's it's great i'm 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 actually really enjoying this because i never actually did a, a full read a, a full second read through so this is my first like full read through where i'm where i'm seeing all of the things that were put in place ahead of time and, and understanding them in context and just noticing a lot more and i think probably paying better attention one funny thing that i've noticed is that when i started reading worm the first time I don't think I had very high expectations because I had some implicit bias about web fiction. Like, oh, it's it's web fiction. It's not <laughs> it's not published by a publisher, so it it's it's not really serious. And not having what like having low expectations led me to not look as hard as I should have been looking. And now that I know what what I'm reading, I can appreciate it way more deeply and um makes me you know obviously reconsider you know i I, i've I've long realized that that was a stupid bias but this is um this reread especially is reinforcing that because i'm seeing how completely wrong i was yeah that's really cool um i i really like reading things this way too i don't really get to do this very often um you know i read so many things and you're just kind of reading it um in a relaxed manner like I get to sit down with this thing and really, really dive into it. And it's really fun. I'm really enjoying this. Um, it helps that the work is good, too. So, Right, yeah. So, uh, unless you had any other comments about this arc, I think that wraps, it, wraps us up for this week. Yeah, no, that was, that was it for me. I like this one a lot. I like this one better than the first one. So, we're, we're, we're scaling upwards. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So, I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. Uh, as always, we appreciate your feedback. We're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice on Twitter, Reddit, as a comment on our page, uh, dailyplanetfilms.com, via email, in our Facebook group, any of these places we're paying attention. We will we will read your feedback. We'll respond to you. We will even mention, we will read it in the in the um in the podcast if if it's uh if it's actionable yeah if you bring up some good points that we didn't consider or um just we want to reinforce some stuff that you said we will talk about it as you saw today um we want this to kind of be as interactive as possible so uh, that requires you guys so please interact it's fun yeah yeah we also have a patreon page patreon.com slash daily planet films d-a-l-y as as always Scott's name if you had to pick that up. (laughs) Um, And if you donate to us, uh, that will enable us to do more with this podcast series. We have some ideas regarding, for example, soliciting like an artwork contest or something. They're very premature ideas, but you know, if we had some funding, we could definitely do some do some fun stuff. Mm -hmm. While while you're on Patreon, don't forget to donate to Wildbo because he does this for a living. And I love Twig and (laughs) and I donate so that he will keep writing Twig. I don't know what that is, but okay. Yeah, there's stick as Scott has referred to it as. Um, so, uh, Scott, where can you be found on the internet? Uh, I am on Twitter uh, at uh, ScottDaily85. Like it's D-A-L-Y, like I said. I almost forgot my Twitter handle right there, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the end of a conversation. My brain's not working as well as it did. Um, yeah. And then also DailyPlanetFilms.com. Uh, I just wrote a review about Kong Skull Island the other day. Um, and we released a podcast today. Well, today as I'm recording this, um, we do another weekly movie podcast, and we talked about the the film Logan. So, if you like superhero stuff, as you probably do if you're reading this, um, you can listen to that one. Yeah, and I am on Twitter at more than a mail, which is written somewhere on the page you're looking at, probably, uh, but can't be spelled. And I write for DailyPlanetFilms.com as well. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and would like to listen to some of our other podcast episodes, um, I would recommend that you perhaps start with our Kryptonian Collection episodes. The Kryptonian Collection is a contest format debate show where contestants argue in favor of their favorite movie and the rotating Council of L votes on whether the proposed film will be entered into the vaunted collection. Yeah. So that's all for today. Yeah, that's that's a really cool podcast. Listen to that one for sure. Those are fun. Yeah. 
yeah, that's those are probably our our most uh, fun and, and interactive, and uh, and it's a continuing series. So uh, drop us a line if you would like to compete. Oh, good. I yeah. like it. Yeah, that's all for today, and we will see you all next week. Bye bye. <laughs>